Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, it's a big showing. Hope I don't fuck it up too much, basically, today. Uh, so the, the, the title of this is The Glorious Madness of Independent AAA Game Development. Um, and it's basically, it's, so yeah, I'm head of production at CD Projekt Red. I um, was executive producer on The Witcher 3, and now I'm senior executive producer. Um, and I kind of manage the lead producers on, on our two big franchises, Cyberpunk now, and it was The, the Witcher 3, and, and we're kind of wrapping The Witcher 3, as you know. I also, I also manage QA, and I manage localization, and, and a few other departments. Um, I've been affiliated with the CD Projekt Red for about nine years. I worked on uh, The Witcher 1 as an, as an external producer uh, for Atari, and then I got hired at CD Projekt Red uh, for, on Witcher 2 to kind of close that, that game, and, uh, and then on Witcher 3 from the beginning. This presentation is for producers, project managers, uh, developers who don't quite understand what producers do, um, execs, you know, the, the money guys. And it's about the craziness of, of video game production, especially on Witcher 3, and it's kind of how we did it, and, you know, what you should think about when, if you're doing something similar. So, uh, CDP Red is kind of uh, unique because we're not only a developer, we're also a publisher. And it, it creates a kind of interesting paradox. Normally, publishers handle things like certification, QA, localization, uh, all the marketing, uh, all the finance, and, and, and you know, devs do everything else. But in our case, in, in my case especially, uh, I have to sort of do the publishing side and development side. So in, in terms of publishing, um, certification is basically dealing with Sony and Microsoft and with Steam and, and uh, in our case with GOG and, and other PC suppliers. We have to do different kinds of builds and meet different kinds of requirements for all these partners. Uh, we also have the ratings process, which is, you know, we're, we're doing an international games, so we have to go through a kind of uh, a check with all the ratings boards to make sure that the, the game's going to pass. And, and for instance, like in Japan, we, we, did, we couldn't have full frontal nudity. Uh, we, we couldn't have decapitations. So we have to make uh, all kinds of amends, amends for preparing the game for these big partners of ours. Uh, QA is also usually handled by a publisher. So uh, and they do all the kind of gameplay QA. But in our case, we had to do it all internally. So we have you know, a big internal embedded QA team and a gameplay team and localization QA, which we, in fact, outsourced. And we have compliance QA. So all that has to be managed. And then localization is also normally handled by a publisher. In our case, we do it. We did it with, uh, because we have a team of localization project managers, which, which, which I was kind of managing in the process. And we had you know, a, a huge localization push uh, uh, for The Witcher, since it was, in, it was released in so many different languages. And then the marketing is also normally handled by the publisher. And in our case, we did all of our, all, most of all of our internal marketing creatively was done by CD Projekt. Um, and we, we, you know, we have external marketing. Uh, we also have internal marketing in, in some cases. And then uh, the finance side is also somehow managed by a, by a producer, um, uh, which normally is, is, is done from a, a publishing side where you deliver milestones and the publisher basically pays you for the milestones. In our case, we have to kind of do it internally, uh, which, which kind of leads to the fact that it's, it's kind of a paradox because normally, you have uh, kind of a push-pull relationship between a publisher and a developer. And it puts the developer into a lot of kind of uh, uh, binding kind of stressful situations to deliver a milestone because you know, you know you have to get paid to do the next milestone. Us, we have to kind of put the pressure on internally, but we're also developing a game. So there's a bit of a paradox here. That's kind, of, that, that kind of a maddening situation in itself. Um, and then the other side of a, of a producer's job is, is the, the development side, which you're all probably aware of. And that starts with conceptual development, and it goes all the way through your post-production. We're also 
uh, managing outsource. Um, in our case, we're doing lots of like mocap outsource and localization was outsourced, a lot of art outsource. So it's our job to actually go and, and, and find our partners, evaluate them, set up the contracts, and, and then manage them uh, on a day to day basis. Uh, also, internal producers like myself have to do lots of recruitments and, and growth. So it's, it's, it's quarterly evaluations of your, of your guys. It's interviewing almost everybody that comes into the studio and so forth. Um, we're doing team structuring. So the, the team is restructured throughout the entire project based on whether you want to create strike teams around certain quests or reconfigure your your teams to be more multidisciplinary or you're adding staff and, and, and changing your leads and so producers have to handle that. Project management of course is setting up production methodologies for your different sub teams and making them more, more and more efficient as you go. Then there's internal, internal evangelism. What that is is basically standing up in front of your team and motivating them and reminding them about the goals and the dates and so forth. Uh, then there's event uh, participation, so th at things like Digital Dragons or E3 or Gamescom, you're actually preparing builds and then you're, you're going there and you're talking to journalists and you're organizing the events in some way and you're, you're hand-holding uh, people playing the game through, throughout the game. Uh, and then communication. Communication is it's, it's lateral communication, it's vertical communication up to your board of directors. It's uh, lead communications. We'd have weekly leads meetings and so forth. So you've got this dichotomy. You're, you're kind of a, a publisher and you're a developer. So you have to kind of balance that out throughout your entire production pipeline. OK, the other kind of internal conflict for a producer, at least at CD Projekt Red, is, is managing dates and deadlines but also making sure the game is really high quality. The way we do it at CDP is we have, um, it's, it's a kind of production matrix. So our, our leads uh, are, are more focused on quality and, and creative, and our producers are more focused on, on dates. And so we, almost have, we have partnerships throughout the entire team. Our, our studio head was partnered with me, basically, ahead of production. We have a lead producer who's partnered with our game director. We've got um, a lead artist or artists uh, teamed up with other producers and, and so forth. So we have this dichotomy and we have this, this little kind of matrix I put here. And what we try to, how do we, how we think about it is, is producers have kind of a 25% responsibility for, for quality. And, but their, their primary focus is on, is on dates, leads are, 75% focused on quality and 25% focused on the day. So there's a, a natural balance between the two sides. That, that doesn't mean that CDP as a whole is not totally focused on quality. We are, but we just have to have this kind of uh, mix. Uh, during the, the production of Witcher 3, we actually shifted the date a, date a few times. We had one internal shift. Um, before we announced the release date, and then we had a big uh, shift of release date. And, and, and both times it was about quality. So we were pushing really hard to hit these dates from production side, but we reached the sort of kind of crux moment. We had to decide whether it was going to be good enough. And so very hard decisions, but, but we had to make it. And it was so also a very difficult time for a producer because we're pushing the team as hard as we possibly can to hit a certain date, but then suddenly, you know, we announced that we're going to shift the date and go back into another period of, of, of intense work. So this next sort of set of slides is about the different roles and more detail about what we play as, as producers. And the first thing is kind of a, we kind of have to be psychics. Um, because we're Basically, we either decide what the ship date's going to be or we're, we're kind of dictated what a ship date's going to be. Uh, and that's without really knowing too much about the game or the pipelines or about how, how we're actually going to do it. So there's lots of speculative modeling going on here. Um, there's usually a meeting with the board of directors. They say, okay, we need to release it here. 
And, I mean, there's a lot of reasons behind that, obviously, because it's, there's financial obligations. There's, uh, we've got a big team, so our monthly burn rates are quite high. So it's like, okay, guys, we need, we need to get it out here. Uh, and that's before we're doing any kind of like detailed planning. Uh, so it's, it's quite speculative, but we do have to come up with something that makes sense. And, and the way we do that is we, we do some kind of, um, what do we call it? We, 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 we do roadmap planning. And roadmaps are basically really high level kind of stories or features. And we kind of have to guess how long they're going to actually take to make. So we put, we put together a very high level roadmap, which are best guesses, based on some kind of previous knowledge of workloads. And they're dependent, set up as dependencies. Sometimes we use Microsoft Project for doing some kind of master scheduling. Um, and we put it on paper. And then we say, okay, we can try and make this. The problem, of course, is that there's no evidence that we can do it. So it's, it's totally speculative, and therefore we're psychics. The next role is, this is Felix Baumgartner, uh, the guy that like, went up in a balloon and jumped and parachuted you know, down to Earth. I don't know if you know about this guy. But, it's, but it's, the idea here is that you're really a daredevil. Uh, because you need to go and to uh, make a demo out of nothing. And it's really important to, to do demos. Um, basically because we need to establish things. We need to establish proper time boxes and, and proper pipelines. And, 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 and so it's, it's, it's quite hard and intense period for the team. But you have to push for these demos. Um, and oftentimes you're hacking things together. Uh, just to make it work. Um, for instance, our first demo for The Witcher 3 was this ice giant demo. I don't know if you guys had seen it or not. Um, but at that point, we, were, you know, we weren't running on consoles. Uh, we had no idea what kinds of sort of performance limitations we would have on consoles. So it was also quite speculative. But and it was another intense period of production. We were really pushing the team uh, to make it work. But in the end, we, we could like have more certainty, we could actually establish some better pipelines and we could establish some better uh, time boxing so we, could, so we could plan out the project a little bit better. Um, and, you know, in the end it was, sorry. It really paid, it paid off in the end um, for a lot of reasons, you know, the team, the team learned how to work together better um, and we actually, got to show something at one of the shows. So the, it was really hard. The team was like crying during the process of creating the demo, but, but uh, the morale was, was massive uh, uh, when we actually were able to, to deliver upon it. Now, the Witcher, the Witcher 3, I counted them. We had five such demos, which, which I don't know how you guys, if you guys know how hard it is to create demos in the course of a, a production, because basically it's, you're sidelining the team. Um, you're, you're stopping what you're doing to, to get to the end point, and everyone's scrambling to get to put together a demo. So, yeah, there were five demos. There was, there was the Ice Giant, there was this Leshen demo, there was, there was our, our Griffin demo for, for, for the Microsoft conference, and there, and there were two additional demos, this, this Johnny demo and then uh, the last one, which was a feast. So quite intense, and, but really important um, for us to continue to sort of refine our planning. Well, we also, something similar to demos, we also created uh, about 20 trailers uh, for the game. And since we're doing all of our, our marketing ourselves, uh, you know, we were doing all the trailers ourselves as well. Uh, it, it, there were a few exceptional cases, um, you know, the full pre-rendered cinematics, like the one Digic did for us or Platige did for us. Um, but we're also involved in those, and we're, we're, we're directing them. We're heavily involved, produ not producers per se, but some of our designers and our directors are heavily involved in planning uh, those, those trailers and directing them. Again, so I if you guys aren't going to get the wrong, wrong idea about Friedrich Nietzsche on, on, on the page here, but the, but the idea here is, is after you do a demo, you, you need to attempt to gain more certainty. Uh, but there's, you know, the thing about certainty is that there is no such thing as certainty. It's, and, and Nietzsche said, uh, 
it's, it's something that, that drives one insane. I mean, there's, there's, other, there's other quotes about certainty and uncertainty. Uh, Voltaire said, uncertainty is uncomfortable position, uncomfortable position, but certainty is an absurd one. And then the only certainty is that nothing is certain. So obviously it's impossible to, to become fully certain, especially in game development, because you're trying to create you know, something fun and, 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 and visually appealing and, and so forth. And it's an art form more than it's a science, but you know, the role of a producer is to, to try to attain the certainty. Um, and you do, your, you do your best to do that. So after the demos, we can then revisit our game design and we start making changes. Um, we do things like more detailed planning. Um, all the teams are doing detailed planning for pre-production at this point. We're modifying our roadmaps. Um, we're reducing scope. We're grooming the backlog. We're tightening our pipelines. We also we need to replan. We need to make more time and schedule for demos um, needed by marketing. We need to start meeting with our partners, Sony and Microsoft and, and Steam and Origin. And we need to start thinking about certifi certification requirements, both business and technical. Um, and we need to start tracking teams uh, with more focus on, on how long it takes to finish something. Um, uh, that way we can actually do some landing date planning. Now, landing date planning is, is really important. And that's how we, uh, that's how we modify or, or we de-risk our project. Is because what we do is we, we look at our sub-teams and we look at how many resources we've got or how many resources we're actually going to hire and, and, and their potential workloads. And, and also based on our scope. And then we can, we can actually sort of model out when we think each sub-team is going to finish. And then based on those kind of finish dates, we can see what we need to do, what, if we need to cut more scope or add more people and so forth. And we do that on a sub, uh, sort of team to team, sub team basis. We're also setting up our production methodologies in this period. And at CD Projekt, we use lots of different production methodologies. We're using uh, things like waterfall for, for creating assets for characters and locations. And uh, our, our cinematics team was set up in Kanban system. Our features and our, our engine features and our gameplay features are done in some modified form of Scrum. Um, and, and the advice here is to you know, use the right production methodology for your, for your, for your sub-teams. Don't try to use one method to solve everything. Um, some tips uh, on this slide. Make sure your, your creatives are obviously involved in, in your scope reduction. That's where that sort of 25% date thing comes in, is that your creatives need to be heavily involved. Um, obviously, even though you're using the same product, different production methodologies for different sub-teams, you need to sync your, sync your milestone dates. Um, and at the same time, don't worry about per perfect precision. Uh, it's impossible to be to know exactly when you're going to finish something. But you know, use your uncertainty. Uncertainty is believed to be a real catalyst for creativity. If you knew everything that was going to happen in the future, it would be a uh, uh, boring job. So you know, the uncertainty side of it is, is actually really important. But still, as a producer, you need to be as certain as you possibly can. After you've kind of gone into your pre-production planning and, and now you're, you're going into production, the role of a producer becomes kind of uh, 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 twofold. You're, you're still a bureaucrat or a technocrat. You're still planning and you know, managing expectations from, from the top down. Um, but you're also joining inside of teams. You're, you're leading uh, in some cases. Uh, in our case, we were actually setting up uh, strike teams around quests, and our producers or our line producers were joining those teams and running the stand-up meetings. So, you, uh, so on one side, yeah, you're, you're a publisher, and the other side, you're, you're a developer at the same time. So it's kind of mad. This is a picture of, of uh, the character from District 9. I don't know if you remember him, but yeah, he was a techno technocrat, and, uh, but he got this, the, the alien DNA, so he became more like an alien, so that's kind of how I felt or how we feel as producers. 
Um, during this period, uh, the game becomes more re re uh, review-driven development. So what's, what's happening is that, yeah, you're, you're sitting in a strike team and you're delivering quests and uh, your directors and your leads are reviewing the feedback and the feedback's going into some system and the, the developers are responding to it. So it's all review-driven period. Um, and at the same time, you need to, to strive for, for greater efficiency, for more certainty along the way, no matter how absurd it might seem. You're, you're, you're trying to get more and more certain as you go. Um, one sort of psychological tool that I think about when we're trying to be more efficient is this thing, I don't know if you've heard about it, it's called cognitive flow psychology. Um, cognitive flow is, is a system, uh, it's kind of a way of thinking. Um, uh, and, and it's kind of compared to being uh, to, in, to extreme sports. So uh, like uh, big wave surfers or, or base jumpers or any kind of athlete. And, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to, to keep people uh, not overly challenged so they, so they become frustrated, but just challenged just beyond what their capabilities are. Um, and, and, and challenging their skill level. Well, so you don't want them to become bored, and you need to keep them, you know, just challenged enough. And the, the, the effect is, or the result is, you want to get people into kind of a zone. Um, this kind of zone is like when you kind of, even when you're playing video games, you, you get so much sucked into what you're doing that, that time just flies by, and you become much more efficient. So it's kind of win-win, because people are really happy, because they're, they're thoroughly challenged. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're, they're a lot more efficient. So I like to kind of think about uh, making sure everybody on the team is, is sufficiently challenged. And it's important that you know what everybody's working on and you're talking to them and making sure that they're doing th things they actually want to work on and that it's, you know, it's just beyond their capability of actual uh, ability. And uh, so it's, it's, for us, it's a win-win way of thinking. Okay, so you're through, you're through production, you're through development, uh, well, at least the, the main the core part of production and you need to close the project. It's a really important part of the job for, for a producer. Um, some tips here. Identify your critical path um, or your critical paths. Uh, the, the, the more important, well, one of the most important critical paths for us at CD Project was actually this kind of localization uh, thing because, you know, we, we came out in seven spoken languages and we had 13 written languages. Um, and there's so many things dependent upon getting something into localization uh, because it's based on your quest iteration and, and locking down your, your story design and locking down your dialogue. And it's important that you, and you cannot miss these dates because localization is actually outside of your sort of like total burn costs that you have. You know, you have 300 developers burning. Uh, the monthly burn cost is really, really high. So, but the localization costs are high. The localization testing is very high. Uh, the translation is not so not so cheap, but but um, uh, uh, the voice recording is high because you're you're contracting out with different recording studios. You have to cast all the actors. You have to get the, the voice director. So it's it's very expensive, and it's very important that you keep your dates. So that our localization became our critical path in our closing period. Um, the other thing a producer does here uh, is is they're they're the kind of this, this cleaner, and you're you've you've, you've fallen out of review driven, you're still, you're still reviewing the game, but everything that you were doing in production, your pipeline is actually going into a, a bug database at this point. So you, your game or your closing is actually run through, your, through your, your bug database. And a producer's job is actually to go in every morning and triage the bugs. So you're sitting down and you're sitting down with leads or, or whoever you need to sit down with and decide the priorities of the bugs, obviously, and you're waving bugs and you're just kind of grooming your bug database, and that, that's what you're doing every day. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a test-driven development phase. Even your, even your reviews from your, from your directors, all their feedback is now going into your bug database. And so you're, just, you're, you're, you're feeding off of that and, and feeding that into your team. And yeah, QA is king in this process. Um, basically, what we're doing at CD Projekt is, is we have a huge embedded team and it's important to, to have a really sort of tight, tight kind of feedback loop between your developers and your QA guys. So 
Uh, a lot of teams, I think, don't treat QA the right way, but in our, in our company, it's really important and it's really a really critical asset in the studio to have you know, really experienced um, uh, QA analysts that are working very closely with the development team. So they're giving them the feedback they need to, to move a lot faster. Okay, uh, finally you've got the, this other role as a producer and you're, you're a suit, you're a, you're a business guy. And you know, since we're a developer, publisher, we had to do some serious SKU planning, which I was doing from the very beginning of the project. And we had uh, 22 SKUs, the Witcher 3. N normally, uh, or ideally, you have one worldwide SKU uh, for the game. Uh, per platform, so like three SKUs. But in our case, we had so many different deals with so many different territories that we had to create a 22 SKU plan. And, and mostly the differences in the SKU plans were, were language-based. In, in some cases, they're, they're ratings-based. So we, we, would use, we use the same s sort of censored uh, Japanese SKU for the Arabic territories. Um, of course, we had the three platforms. So. Uh, Microsoft, uh, Xbox One and PS4 and then the PC platforms. Um, and there's, in terms of being a businessman, you're doing a lot, lot of negotiation with your, your platform holders. Um, especially in regards to TRCs or, or, I don't know if you guys know what XRs and those, those things are, but basically you've got uh, a whole range of things you have to actually do to make sure it passes through certification. And in some cases, you fail on certain things. So you have to negotiate or create business cases to get out of, of having to do those things. And we did that on a, on a number of issues. Um, then to go along with the SKUs, you know, we had all these diff different distribution partners. And, and luckily, our business development team was dealing more directly with, with these partners. But they might have certain requirements as well that you have to deal with. So all this takes you know, some, some business acumen, in a way. And uh, so, yeah, you, you become this kind of psychopathic business guy at the end as well. So the tips here is, you know, plan early and get buy-in from all your partners. We started having meetings with Sony and Microsoft really early in the process so we could really understand, you know, what, what kind of requirements there would be. And, this, you know, the same with Steam and with Origin. The Origin guy was on site and the Steam guys were, were you know, in close contact during, during the process. Um, and then... Um, you need to make sure you're building your, you know, significant lead times into your into your master planning schedule, um, especially for you know long certification processes. It's different at Sony and Microsoft, for instance. And that's that's this role. So that's, that's kind of the, the 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 thing. By the time you're finished with the project, as you can see, I'm kind of fucking crazy. So this this guy is I don't know if you know Andy Kaufman, but. Um, yeah, you have to, you know, you have conflicting roles that you have to manage and balance during the course of the production. And then uh, the other final point is, is, no matter how absurd it might seem, uh, you, you always have to strive for certainty in planning. And, and going back to this kind of cognitive flow thing and, and, and riding a big wave, I think the uncertainty and, and managing this uncertainty is, is kind of puts you in a zone as a producer. That's your high as a producer is to try and uh, you know, ride this, this sort of leading edge of this wave to, to, to manage this uncertainty. And that's, that's kind of my message to you guys today. And that's, that's it. And, I'll, and since I'm here, I'll plug the Krakow studio, basically, um, because I'm leaving the Warsaw studio and I'm, I'm going to the, the Krakow studio and we're growing fairly significantly. We're going to be... Uh, going to 100, as it says here, but probably more over time if we can find, you know, enough talent down here in the south. And the thing we're going to be doing in Krakow is, is we're going to be working on some really bespoke or uh, discrete areas of, of the cyberpunk project. So uh, hopefully you guys will uh, think about applying to us. And that's the end of my presentation. If you guys have any questions, please, please ask. I don't know how much time we have left. Questions? Nobody? I have another micro mi microphone, so if there are any questions, I can support you. It's all you crystal with. clear, I suppose. Okay, so no questions. 
Good. So thank you very much, okay. John. Thank you. Thank you, guys.